just a little bit of intro. Um, welcome everybody and thanks for coming. I'm Chris Tachibana, board member for the Northwest Science Writers Association. Um, thanks for coming to this informal conversation we're having with experts in nanoscience and science communication. And please note that we're recording this event. NSWA um, starts events with a land acknowledgement. Those of us in the Seattle area are on the traditional land of Coast Salish people, specifically the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people who are still here. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. A few words about NSWA, the Northwest Science Writers Association. We're more than 200 science communicators in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, British Columbia, and benefits of membership include our annual career development grants, membership program, writing awards, job postings, and each month we highlight the published writing of our members. Our events include skill sharing, workshops, author talks, trivia nights, networking events, and sometimes a field trip. And we welcome members from anywhere. We have regular student and a special $1 pandemic rate. Um, so that's all at nwscience.org. Coming up on the 22nd at Seattle's Town Hall, uh, NSWA members Sally James and Bryn Nelson will talk about Bryn's book, Flush, and the science of poop, and we'll meet at Optimism Brewing afterward. And our October event is on art and science. And a reminder to anyone who's an NSWA member already, Please log in, update your profile, and opt into our directory um, for networking and getting hired and things like that. Um, and then for this event, this hour we have speakers from Elizabeth Nance's lab, and we'll introduce them in a moment. I'll just tell you the format. Informal conversation moderated by NSWA board member Jenny Morber, who's a nanoscience and freelance journalist, nanoscientist and freelance journalist. And then we'll have short presentations um, and quest put, so put questions in the Q&A or chat box anytime. We'll also pause periodically in case you wanna you know, read your question yourself. Uh, and now NSWA President Ellen Kawana will introduce Elizabeth Knapps's group. Thank you, Chris. And thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I know we've all had varying degrees of long days today. I just got my COVID booster, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, but it was really hard for me to pare down my introdu introduction for Dr. Nance. Um, so I was fortunate to meet her way back in May of 2018 when I was working for University of Washington Center for Human Development and Disability, and I wrote a research article on her. Um, and I asked her to review it as I do all the subject matter experts because it's their research and they know it the best. And I wanna make sure we got everything correct before it gets published. And she said, you know, sure, I'm a little bit busy. And then, you know, she told me she was getting married in a few days and she's like, but I'll, I'll just, you know, we're, we'll take turns driving. You know, she was driving with her now husband to North Carolina from Seattle. And she's like, when I'm not driving, I'll just, I'll, I'll edit that. And she got it back so quickly. And I was so impressed by that just willingness to go the extra mile, which you will soon catch as a theme, um, that willingness to help other people. And she is a staunch supporter of women and girls in science. Um, that's just so near and dear to my heart as well. Um, and then I saw her pretty quickly after uh, I did the article on her when she was recognized by the Association of Women in Science and received an uh, Early Career Achievement Award in STEM from them. And then a year later, she was recognized with the prestigious Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, which is from the President of the United States. Um, to jump backwards in time a little bit from all these awards, um, she earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at North Carolina State University, her PhD in Chemical Engineering at Johns Hopkins, where she also did her postdoctoral work. Um, and during her graduate time, she applied for and got a patent right for uh, the first nanoparticle to cross the blood brain barrier. So yeah, we all feel a little bit slouchy there with our graduate work. Um, Forbes 30 under 30 in science and medicine named her the most disruptive, game-changing and innovative young personality in science. Um, 
She holds two patents for nanoparticles and I'll let her and her uh, graduate students and postdocs explain that a little bit more to us. Um, she holds several um, professorships at the University of Washington in bioengineering, chemical engineering, an endowed career development associate professor in chemical engineering, um, associate chair for undergraduate studies in chemical engineering, adjunct associate professor in radiology. And what I really love about her training, um, the story of, of, of how she progressed through her career and her training, and then how she's approaching science now is it's so interdisciplinary. And I think people use that as a buzzword, but you will see it is really, really true from her time at Johns Hopkins, working with a chemical engineer who's, um, I think it was his, his wife happened to be a pediatric intensivist who worked in the NICU and said, oh, you might want to talk to her. And then that really began the path down real world problems and how to solve them with the nanoparticles. Um, and then also, as I alluded to, um, she actively mentors um, women and girls, all different levels, um, up to university and through. And she started, I think, five nonprofits to support and promote having more girls and women in STEM fields and particularly in chemical engineering. So um, as you can all tell, I have no subterfuge. I'm a complete fangirl. And with that, I will turn it over to Jenny, who's going to introduce the rest of our speakers. Hi, everybody. Um, I thank you so much, Ellen, for introducing Dr. Nia. We also have with us uh, Sydney, who is a uh, second year PhD student. Is that right, Sydney? Am I getting that right? Okay. And um, her research is on getting nanoparticles into the brain and across the villainized blood brain barrier. So that's exciting. And then we have Fung. Am I saying your name correctly? Please make sure I'm saying your name. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we have Fung, who is a fourth year PhD candidate um, whose expertise is in biological nanoparticles naturally used by the brain and the, their potential implications uh, as treatment options. Is that is that accurate? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're both science communicators. Uh, Fung, I believe, has a blog. Um, I especially enjoyed reading her post on gifts for PhD uh, students, which include cozy slippers and an undergrad because- Oh, yeah, you know it. Are, Absolutely. <laughs> Those are so useful. And Sydney's um, Instagram, if you haven't checked that out, it is so funny and also informative. Uh, probably one of my favorite ones that I looked at was she was like taking different lab protocols and she turned them into a dance. So like, there's like the, the rockin' dance. Anyway, you should go check that out because it is just the full of really great information on being, um, a grad student, but it's also full of humor. Um, so I really enjoyed that. So um, now if I'm correct, and I'm doing this correctly, I think that Dr. Nance um, and the students have, Dr. Nance has uh, like a 10 minute presentation to kind of introduce her work. And then we can have some question and answers. And then we'll also talk to Sydney and Poon. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, Chris, do you mind uh, turning on the screen or the share screen functionality? And I'll just make sure that works. Ellen, that was such a kind introduction. Thank you so much. I don't even know what to say in response to it other than I hope that I can live up to it in the next like 10 minutes. But I will, uh, while we're getting the screen share working, um, definitely also brag on Cindy and Spoon. I mean, they're two phenomenal individuals. I think you'll both, uh, you know, you'll both uh, get to show all the things that you get to, you know, love on every day in your science world today. And um, to everybody joining, I think you'll get to see just, you know, what passion they bring to their science um, and how much fun they bring to the lab, as well as like their innovation in advancing these fields, uh, which is really cool to just be able to mentor and advise. So, I feel pretty lucky most of the time to, to you know, like, like by most of the time where I have to like pinch myself to say, okay, is this like real life that I get to work with these incredible students? Um, 
in the group because they're pretty they're pretty awesome and also highly entertaining uh which keeps me entertained i'm sorry i think you might need to email your slides to chris.tachibana mm, okay. at gmail.com yeah. and i'll put them up i don't seem to be able to um oh yeah nobody's setting. listed as host right now no i think that's part of it Ooh, i hope i can that will be yeah that's a good question i All don't right. see we'll work on this um, if you sorry about that thing. Oh no, it's no problem. I'm just hoping that the file size is not. Oh, you're right, because so... it says host has disabled screen sharing. So, oh gosh, Chris, yeah, are you and logged nobody's in? Nobody's listed as host right now. Um, you might have to go oh, log in, oh, or I'm Jenny, sorry. log in is. Yeah. Is, okay. Um, what do I need to do? Is NASW. In the um, meantime, I have questions. If you guys okay. would like to just answer some questions, I yeah, we definitely can. Questions. Um, we definitely can. I'm, okay. I'm emailing it to you, Chris, but by the time that file cut size comes through, oh. <laughs> it, okay. might, it might be the end of the event. So. <laughs> oh gosh, I am yeah, so sorry can. about this. No, no, it's issue. fine. I think it's. I think if you, if somebody logs in where their host, it should, um, it should allow for screen sharing. But yeah, Jenny, we're happy to. Okay. Um, some of them are based more, more on me. stuff that probably you will go over. So I'll skip right down to my like weird and random questions, which is Excellent. um, what is your favorite cool science fact? Oh wow, that's a tough one. Um okay. Well, okay, Foon and Sydney, if you have an answer before I have an answer, please give it. <laughs> it could be about anything. You know, it could be like the whale anus is approximately the size of a grapefruit, which is mine. So I yeah, I did actually uh, read about that at some point when I was in this is going to sound terrible that this is being recorded in, a, in an Icelandic uh, penis museum. Sorry for everybody. Um, but that was fascinating. Uh, if you're ever in Iceland, that's one of their main tourist destinations. Yeah. That wasn't going to be my fun fact. <laughs> Science fact. Sydney's unmuted, though, so I'm going to let her go ahead. <laughs> Ah, I mean, there's a ton of things like picking one is difficult. I have a special. Uh, fascination with the golden ratio um and just how often that's found in nature between like so many different kinds of uh science like a lot of science is like typically pretty isolated but then you have this golden ratio which like connects plants with like galaxies and human body and then also our like art and stuff which is so cool um and also the fruit that eats you back is uh <laughs> is really the fruit cool. that eats you back what's the fruit that eats you back is it grapefruit it's pineapple, I thought, right? Oh, yes, it's pineapple. <laughs> it's got like enzymes in it that, that yeah. like eat you as you're eating it, right? Yes, slowly, slowly, tiny, tiny. They're <laughs> like, ah, I will have my revenge. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a that's a, I'm glad you brought that up because my fun fact, and I'm going to plug that I have an article about this in my blog, but my fun science fact is also like fruit related. Um, <laughs> but the uh, figs are actually not vegan because they have a special, figs have evolved to basically be carnivorous and they specifically, uh, they specifically eat a part, like a, a, a wasp, it's like a special fig wasp. And so that's why figs are actually not, not, um, not vegan because of evolution. And I think that's really, really cool. <laughs> That um, is pretty cool. Thanks for waiting, everybody. I think you should be able to sh screen share. Oh, yeah, sure. Give it a try. I was just going to say, Jenny, mine is that uh, mine is mostly tied around what dogs can do. And I think probably most people know their sense of smell, but that part of that's because they create little uh, eddy currents, like the same thing that you see in the ocean, where you have really like local turbulence that allows them to get like maximal contact with the surface area of their nose Whoa. to be able to enable smelling. So the way their nostrils are designed, enable like that sort of creation of local like turbulent currents of of air in the nose to increase contact area to get like the sensitivity that you need that so is I always so find that cool. they, they they figure out the fluid dynamics of a dog's nose yeah yeah there's some really cool actually um magnetic resonance imaging studies of airflow in the dog's nose uh that show these little turbulent like eddy currents and sort of how it increases contact uh surface area and then the nasal cavity i find it i find that uh, kind awesome. of fascinating yeah 
Um, cool. Are we, should we, we're good to yeah, let's do it. get going? Awesome. Okay. I'm try. And then I'm, I'm excited to um, see what the additional <laughs> random questions you have are. Um, okay. Is that working? Can people see screen? Okay. I can see, see all of you in the chat. So um, yeah, so I, we're really excited to be here. Um, like I mentioned, uh, Foon and Cindy do a lot of science communication work and we do a lot of outreach and work to try and raise awareness of all the cool things about nanotechnology and neuroscience and the ways that those two fields can intersect. So um, I'm going to kind of kick us off with some really general broad um, aspects of the work that we do and then kind of where our motivation is and some of the successes that we've seen for translation and give some plugs for where Foon and Sydney will um, provide some additional depth uh, and deep diving into topics that they spend a lot of time um, really thinking about. So I'll just um, acknowledge the, you know, that we also um, want to take a minute um, to be grateful for the land that we work on and for the ancestral um, rights to the land and the stewards past and present of the land. Um, we certainly are, are very much in gratitude at UW for the fact that we do work, learn, and teach on the land of the Coast Salish peoples. And we always want to make sure that we uh, honor and, and acknowledge that. Um, and I'll, I'll also kind of just give a broad motivation of what a lot of our lab work is focused on, um, which I think this graphic hopefully gets across, which is that whenever we're thinking about taking things, um, whether it's something as simple as ibuprofen or Tylenol or like an eyedropper using to lubricate your eye, the goal of all of that is to have medicine go where it's supposed to go and last as long as it's needed. And you don't really want it going elsewhere and you don't want, to want it lasting or acting when you don't need it to be. Um, acting. And so I've shown a lot of things I think we're fairly familiar with, like eye drops, nasal sprays, inhalers. The one on the bottom right, I hope most people aren't familiar with because that's an implantable uh, technology that is for brain tumor treatment that was approved in 1995. But it is an example of where the goal was to get delivery of a drug to the local tumor environment, in this case in the brain, um, to really make sure that the medicine was only going where it's needed. But there are limitations to a lot of this. You can imagine if you think about like how frequently do you have to take an inhaler? How often do you have to drop eye drops in? Um, how often might you have to use a nasal spray? How invasive is putting implants into the brain? All these things still have limitations. And that's where we think nanotechnology really has potential. It's still getting this concept of getting medicine where it needs to go, but making sure that it's done so in a safe and controlled and as minimally invasive way um, as possible. So. That's what I'm going to really get into is this talking about how nanotechnology can be used in medicine to try and improve um, the site specificity of delivery of a drug. So getting it to sick cells or dying cells rather than to healthy cells um, and then being able to control when the drug is released and active in that environment and how long it's active for. Um, and these are things that a lot of the nanotechnology field really works on quite extensively. So I'll start off with what nano is, just in case it's, I mean, we're all, I think actually everybody interacts it, with it every day. If you use sunscreen, you have interacted with nanotechnology every single time you use sunscreen. That's the underlying technology in how sunscreen works. Um, but I always like this graphic because it really helps us put it to scale, where if we think about the relative size difference between a nanoparticle and a soccer ball, it's the same difference in size as if you compare a soccer ball to the size of the earth. That's pretty huge difference in scale, but it can kind of give you an appreciation of if then when I say take one of your strands of hair and make it smaller by 10,000, and that's what the size of a nanoparticle is. Um, we're talking really tiny scale. And this can be applied in a number of dimensions. So you can have nano in one dimension, you can have nano in two dimensions, and you can have nano in three dimensions. And when we talk about nano, usually that means something is at least nano in one dimension. Um, when we use nanotechnology, we're using it in three dimensions. So like a spherical ball uh, nanoparticle, which would be nano in all, uh, in all dimensions. There's a lot of different types of nanoparticles and everybody's probably really familiar with one of these types. Um, I'm gonna throw all of them up here that we tend to see the most of, but this liposomal formulation is what's the basis of the COVID vaccine. Uh, and so there's a lot of different buzzwords that you'll hear thrown around about different types of nanoparticles but they all have fairly similar uh, features to them. And it's really just what the base chemistry is that makes them up, that changes kind of what they're defined as. And there's benefits and, and dis, you know, advantages and disadvantages to all different types. A lot of the disadvantages in science is that academics tend to get caught up on one type and that's what they spend their whole career doing. 
Um, and it kind of can pigeonhole us into thinking that one nanoparticle is the end all be all to all of our problems. And one of the things our lab has intentionally tried to do is be nanoparticle agnostic. So not to just think about or focus on one type of nanoparticle. So we do some comparative work across different types of nanoparticles um, to try and see how much is dependent on the chemistry and how much is dependent on the application and where's kind of the intersection um, of that. I don't have listed on here because they're way too cool to put on a slide like this, biological nanoparticles, which are naturally produced in the body, but Foon's gonna talk about those. They're a very rapidly evolving and exciting area of research, particularly for thinking about where we might get um, new or novel therapies or drug uh, delivery um, platforms that the body already naturally knows what to do with. So I'm not gonna steal any of her thunder because she's gonna do uh, show you some really cool visuals and some basics on um, biological nanoparticles as well. But what's super cool about nano, I think, I just want to highlight is that at this scale, you have everything is unique. Everything is kind of controllable and unique. So all of the physical properties, the chemical properties, mechanicals, like how stiff or rigid something is, optical properties, magnetic properties, these are all unique and they naturally occur at that scale. And it's different from if you made the same material in bulk. So if you take a gold nanoparticle and a gold bar, if anybody has gold bars, please let me know, I wanna be your friend. Um, if you take a, a gold nanoparticle and a gold bar, the properties of those are gonna be very different and they're much more controllable in the gold nanoparticle form. And you can tune a lot more of it in the gold nanoparticle form than you can with like a gold bar equivalent. The other thing that's super cool, which I think is really neat and like captured well in this graphic, is what it means when you shrink something down to the size scale. So if you think about controlling a volume, so say you have like a one centimeter cube and you make up that cube of one millimeter cubes, you get a tenfold increase in, in surface area. If you then make that nanometer cube, it exponentially increases how much surface area you have. It's kind of shown in this graphic where as you get smaller and smaller in terms of what fills that volume, volume, you get a lot more surface area. Now that's super important from a drug delivery perspective because if you think about what a nanoparticle is interacting with and how a drug might interact with that nanoparticle, the amount of surface area you have is actually quite important in that case. Like the more surface area you have, the more interactions you can, you can drive, the more drug you can potentially incorporate or interact with that particle. And so that is one of the biggest advantages of nanotechnology is that in the same volume, you have a lot more tunable knobs that you can play with um, to incorporate a drug in. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot, like everything that you could possibly think of. Um, so I love this visual because it really shows every single knob you can turn on a nanoparticle. So the size of the nanoparticle, like how big on that one to one hundred nanometer scale is it? What is it made of? What's the shape of it? How stiff is it? How rigid is it? How porous is it? Is it more like a sponge or is it more like a, you know, like a lacquer that you can't absorb anything to it? What can you stick on the surface of it? Like what's the chemistry on the surface? Um, can you put all the bells and whistles or can you do different types of reactive groups that could be used to interact with a tissue or a cell? or something that you're trying to interact with. And so this kind of level of control is really fascinating and really enabling when you're thinking about delivering to a particular target um, in the body. But this is something that we really like to think about, but this is also why a lot of people have villainized nanotechnology. So I was telling Jenny before um, that the one thing that often we see in communication about nanotechnology, maybe not so much with COVID because that helped a little bit in kind of normalizing nanotechnology, but I like, I love showing this to students when I teach a class on this, because it shows that if you go back to 1881, there are actual like science fiction books that use nanotechnology as the root of all evil for destroying society because of this ability to fine tune and control all aspects of it. And I think most people are, are well aware of Michael Crichton's book, Prey, um, about, you know, collective nanobot thinking and how it overtakes society. Uh, but it, it's not a new concept. It's just rarely been displayed in a good uh, as an agent of good or in a good manner. But in, in medicine, it's actually been quite impactful. So if we just look at the timeline of nanotechnology and medicine, um, this is a, 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 a the, probably the best summative graphic I can find of it, but that liposome nanoparticle, which is basically just made up of fat, um, was first des like designed and published in 1964 and was first approved in humans to be used in humans for drug delivery in 1995. So COVID is not new, like the COVID vaccine is not new. It's been around 
um, for quite a while. And there's been a lot of other nanoparticle types like polymers and protein-based nanoparticles and micelles and all these other words you hear kind of thrown around that have developed over that same number of decades. So it has been in the clinic for quite some time. And globally, there's about 100 nanoparticles that are approved for use in humans for a huge range of different applications and five that are approved for use um, in the brain. So it's a it's, it's a established enough technology that is doing good that maybe eventually we'll see this pop culture representation turn into something uh, much more positive. But I do want to say that COVID has really um, helped, I think, bring nanotechnology in a positive way back into the forefront. Um, the liposomal nanoparticle is actually a pretty simple nanoparticle system. It doesn't have all those bells and whistles on it. And the active agent is the messenger RNA. And this was distributed to billions of people, right? Like this is the largest scale delivery system that we have seen, um, and it's a nanoparticle delivery system. And so I think there's a lot of excitement and potential that this vaccine, um, or at least two of the vaccines are with nano of these lipid nanoparticles, has really, you know, enabled for sort of the next phase of nanotechnology um, and medicine. And so that's where I'll do a little bit of a shift of kind of like taking this as our inspiration. Um, for thinking about, okay, how do we use this in the brain? And why would we want to use this in, in the brain? Um, and so I'm going to like show you a, a, give you this video playing while I talk about this, but um, nano operates on this really tiny scale, right? And the brain is our most complex organ and, and it controls our entire body. But how it actually communicates, cells within the brain communicate and how the brain functionally works also operates on the nano scale. So these are synapses, these are neurons firing and talking to each other. And all of that occurs at the same scale at which nanotechnology exists. And so if we think about the potential here of having something that can act on the same scale at which the brain operates, but that has a whole body effect, um, I think that's a really cool potential technology to be, to be thinking about. We also know, I'm sure all of us know, somebody who has a brain disease or suffers from some neurological dysfunction. I've had chronic migraines my entire life and neurological disease runs extensively through my family. So I often joke fairly morbidly that if I don't have a neurological disease by the time I'm like 45, I'll be pretty lucky because that would go against what my entire family history um, shows. And that's one of the main reasons I got into this field in the first place was because of that history um, in my family. But we all can probably think of either something we've experienced or family members that we've had who've had some form of a neurological disease and none of them have a cure, right? We don't have any cure um, for any of these diseases so far. And so we've been super interested in kind of thinking about how can nanotechnology, which operates on the same scale as what most of the brain functions at, be useful in getting drugs into the brain to treat some of these diseases. And it's a super complicated problem to tackle. I mean, the brain is our most important organ, arguably it controls all of our function and it's designed to be very well protected, right? From everything in the environment. That includes getting drugs into it. Um, and so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because Cindy's gonna talk about it, but one of the biggest barriers is getting anything from the blood into the brain. And the blood brain barrier is this highly restricted barrier that keeps out about 98% of all molecules when it's intact and functional. And so if you were to get, to have to interface with that, so you're not directly injecting into the brain, then this is a pretty restrictive barrier to overcome. But Sydney is gonna talk more about that. And she's got a lot of expertise in this, particularly in understanding and modeling it. So I'm not gonna steal her thunder on that because she has also a lot of really pretty and super cool images to talk about that. But the other thing we think about is what happens after you get past this barrier or you get around this barrier, then what do you have to navigate? And how do you get from your target site or your entry site to your target site. So once you get into the brain, what do you do to have to navigate this pretty complex space to be able to get to that disease site or that sick site or that dying site that you wanna treat? And then how do you act only at that site? Because you don't wanna affect healthy brain cells. Um, and so how do we actually get a cell specific effect of the dying and disease cells? And this is not like an independent process. You can't just look at one and not look at the other two. So we kind of, a lot of our work kinds of tries to think about all three of these barriers collectively working together and how we might be able to navigate them. And one of the biggest limitations we've seen in addition to overcoming the blood brain barrier is not being able to navigate the tissue space after you overcome it, if you're able to. And so a lot of the group focuses, a lot of our research focuses on that. But we have done it successfully and we do have work that is moving um, towards the clinic, uh, to, towards clinical application. This is just a really pretty picture I'm showing you that's gonna like sum up like 
12 years of work. Uh, but this is uh, a nanoparticle in red. And what we're seeing here is a cross section of a cerebral palsy brain. Um, a lot of our work really looks at treating the newborn or pediatric brain. It's a population of patients that's highly underserved. There's very little technology development. Definitely happy to discuss why it's hard to get technology into kids. Um, but what I'm showing here is that if we think about wanting to get nanoparticles only to where there are six cells, uh, outlined in like this dashed white line are the areas that are that are injured, um, for the parts of the brain that are dying or that are having ongoing injury that are causing problems like loss of use of arms and limbs, loss of inability to swallow, uh, limited respiration, a lot of things that we see in cerebral palsy patients. This isn't an animal model, but um, it's, it models pretty well what you see in, in uh, humans. And you can see this red pretty well stays confined to within these dashed lines. Um, and so this is something that we really were excited about that with the design of this relatively simple nanoparticle, we could get this specific uptake in only regions of injury. We're not getting into all this other blue region where we see that we don't see injury. And then where it's localized in these regions is also in the cells that are driving the ongoing disease. So that's the place where we want to deliver the drugs is basically shut those cells down, stop them from driving the disease, uh, and then get that therapeutic, uh, that therapeutic effect. So it can be done, and we've done this with a number of different nanoparticles with three different nanoparticle types. Um, if you think back to that, that diagram I showed of the 12 different nanoparticle types, we've done this with three. And then Foon's recent work has shown the ability to do this with a fourth, with a natural, natural occurring nanoparticles. But this is in animal models. So I just want to touch on, because I know Chris or Ellen mentioned this in our email conversations, what does this mean for humans? Um, so, you know, we can do a lot and y'all probably see a lot of papers that get published or a lot of news that comes out about people curing things in rats. Uh, that cerebral palsy model was in rabbits. Um, so, you know, you could argue we're curing things in rabbits instead of rats, but um, what does this mean if we can do it in an animal model for doing it and uh, getting it to work into a human and especially for us, uh, tiny humans, uh, newborn or, or pediatric um, humans. This is where I'm going to come back to the COVID vaccine and why I think it's so cool. Um, this is this is the representation of the COVID vaccine with a lipid nanoparticle. In the grand scheme of things, it is a relatively simple nanoparticle. You can see a couple of different types of lipids. Those are the pink, green, and and uh, blue, and this other pink squiggle here. Cholesterol, which is used in small amounts to help stabilize the nanoparticle and kind of keep it structural, um, and then the active ingredient, the drug which in this case is messenger RNA. That's pretty simple. There's not much to that. Um, and one of the things I think was super important uh, lesson to take away from this, that's something that we've really worked on in our lab is keeping it simple so that you can translate. Because humans are pretty complex. We're pretty heterogeneous. If you were to put this nanoparticle in all of us, which is why they tested it in so many people, you'd have to check to make sure that it's doing what you want it to do. Even though we all have different genetics, we all have different diets, we all have different sleep and stress schedules, we all have different environments. We all have all these different things that affect how this would interact in our body. Um, and so keeping it simple actually enables that. So if we think about all these knobs that can be turned, one of the things that we really try and hold ourselves account accountable to is this sort of COVID vaccine example, which is to keep it as simple as possible. And I love this quote. It, it is actually by Claire Booth Luce. So sometimes it gets misquoted to Da Vinci, is not misquoted by Da Vinci. I did a lot of research on this. The Claire Booth Luce quote, um, the height of sophistication is simplicity. And I think this is a really great thing for us, you know, in the nanotechnology field to hold ourselves accountable to, which is thinking about what do we absolutely need in design for a nanoparticle to be effective? The COVID vaccine was really effective and super simple. And there's a lot of other things you could have done to that nanoparticle that weren't needed. And that's important because if we think about manufacturing, you think that we had to have global distribution of that nanotechnology. We needed it to be distributed safely. We needed it to stay stable, so to stay in the form that we knew it was going to be active in. And we needed it to work in a huge range of people, right? Um, and so I think that these are kind of things that we really try to think about in our lab in designing our nanoparticles. Our nanoparticles are all pretty simple. They're quote unquote boring to most uh, engineers. And that's intentional because those are things that we think are actually translational. And we've seen, particularly with the COVID vaccine example, um, actually be something that can be scaled and can be applied uh, to a bunch of different a, a bunch of different humans in a lot of different settings um, as well. So I'm gonna leave it at that and happily take uh, any questions. I'm also just gonna quickly show off my team because they're awesome. 
Um, we have a fantastic group at UW, about 30 plus people. Um, social media uh, tags are there if you want to follow us um, on social media. And a lot of cool different funding sources that are really, actually, I think our funding sources probably better capture how interdisciplinary our work is with data science and, uh, you know, pediatric and clinical focused uh, foundations with basic science foundations with Department of Defense funding. Um, we have a, it's a lot of uh, funding support that does a lot of, uh, you know, helps us um, do a lot of this cool work, but the people really make it um, what's so fun. Uh, and so I'll definitely, as you'll see when Foon and Sydney um, talk about some of the stuff they do, uh, it's just a great team. And we get to do a lot of really creative and innovative things because all of these individuals kind of bring their whole selves to the table um, and bring, you know, all of their ideas and thoughts and really help us drive and, and think um, you know, practically, but outside the box about what we can do uh, in this space. Thank you, Dr. Nance. That was fantastic. Um, if anyone has questions for Dr. Nance, you can um, you can raise your hand um, in your chat screen, and I will uh, call on you, or you can just drop them in the chat. Um, but if no one has questions, I'll I'll answer a couple. Um, one of mine is that, um, at least when I was doing my work, a big concern was not just getting the nanoparticles where they needed to go, but like you, right. I think you touched on getting them back out, because um, ones that tend to stay really well tend to never leave, like yes. the mother-in-law that comes to visit and just, <laughs> and just won't go. So um, can you talk a little bit about that and if that's a concern for you guys? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we do our best to work with materials that either would degrade naturally. So um, like one of our platforms degrades into lactic and glycolic acid, which are kind of natural um, metabolic components of most normal cell cycles. Um, but it is important to think about that degradation time and what degradation by byproducts might do to a cell, like if those are going to cause problems themselves. And so that's certainly something we test. Um, for particles that don't degrade, I think this is a really important question. I don't know if a lot of people recall um, or saw this study, but I think it was 2014 or 2015, there was a paper that came out that showed one of the agents they used for, for magnetic resonance imaging, gadolinium, which is a nanoparticle, um, can reside in tissue for up to 30 years after it was injected. Wow. It's in really small amounts and it doesn't, it didn't seem to be causing any problems, at least not by any measure that was detectable. Um, but it, so it was purely a retrospective study. But I think it brings up this really important question that you bring up, Jenny, which is how, where do, you know, once they've done their job, is there a way that we can get rid of them if they are not naturally broken down by the cell? That um, visual I showed with the red and the blue, that, that nanoparticle is not degradable. It doesn't naturally degrade. But what we have seen is that once the cell is done with it, it basically spits it back out and it gets cleared wow. through normal clearance mechanisms. So, and that's largely because of the size of it. It's just so tiny. It's like four nanometers in size. So you just, you just pee it out, is Basically. what you're saying. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. yeah. And so if it doesn't get into the brain in the first place, it gets cleared out by the kidneys and you, and you basically just pee it out. If it gets into the brain and gets into the cells that we want it to get into and does and releases the drug and does its job, it will get released by the cells. That time scale we don't know very well, and we don't really know the mechanism, but we can kind of see that profile based on urine output. Right, um, right. fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's probably time to hear from the students and do the student presentation. So I yeah. don't know who's planning on going first, but um, any either uh, of you go ahead. I don't know if you plan. But yeah, let me just go ahead go. and share my screen. Yeah. yeah. Um, here we go. All right. Cool. Okay. So hello, my name is Spoon. Uh, I am a fourth year PhD candidate at UW in the Nance lab. And I'm really thrilled to just be here to speak with you all alongside you know, Elizabeth, of course, and Sydney as well. I today I'll be talking about biological nanoparticle therapeutics in the brain. Uh, and this has been a topic of interest of mine for the past couple of years. And I think it's a really exciting field of research. And I think it also really speaks to the interdisciplinary nature of our lab because it's not only important, you know, to understand the engineering components that go into nanoparticle uh, drug delivery, but also it's important to understand the biological aspects as well. So I'm just gonna get right into this presentation. So you had, 
you know, you had just heard from Elizabeth about all the great, like a wonderful overview about the impact of nanotechnology on research, particularly in the brain. Uh, just as a recap, nanoparticles, there's a lot of different types of nanoparticles and there are, they can be classified into four different classes. I have listed three here um, that are human made nanoparticles. And this is really what the bulk of nanotechnology research currently focuses on. You have your organic, your inorganic, and then your carbon based nanoparticles. Uh, however, biological nanoparticles are becoming a really exciting and growing field of research in nanotechnology. And biological nanoparticles generally are naturally occurring nanoparticles that are synthesized within a biological organism. So for example, you have nanoparticles that your cells uh, excrete and uh, that your cells uh, produce. You also have nanoparticles produced by organisms such as bacteria. Um, and this category of nanoparticles also, uh, also includes nanoparticles made from materials that are naturally occurring, such as spider silk. So there's been a lot of research on like spire silk nanotechnology, which is really cool as well. Uh, so just to be clear, biologic nanoparticles are a different class. They're different from these first three class uh, in that these, these three classes are human made. So they're synthesized in the lab, whereas biological are produced by a biological organism. So here are just a couple of examples of biological nanoparticles. And I'm gonna go over each one of these uh, in the next, upcoming slides, but just to give you an idea, there are a lot of, there's a wealth of biological nanoparticles. And some of you might have even heard of these before, like lipoproteins or perhaps exosomes, uh, but maybe you've never heard about them in the context of biological nanoparticles. So that's really what I'm trying to show through this presentation to kind of get your mind thinking about these naturally occurring agents, but in the context of nanoparticle and nanotechnology. So, as I mentioned, biologically, biological nanoparticles are biologically synthesized and derived. And so what that often means is that they are very diverse in both identity and functionality. So as an example of their diversity, uh, exosomes, for example, deliver cargo between cells. They're a really important aspect of cell communication within your body. And so cells naturally excrete and uptake exosomes in the body. You have your vir virus-like particles, for example, which actually they, virus-like particles include the, the protein shell of a virus, but they don't contain the genetic material. And these are actually really highly, really popular in vaccine development because of this core structure that they have. Um, you have ferritin, which is actually a naturally occurring blood protein. Um, ferritin exists in nano cages, and this nano cage form allows it to be a really a great potential carrier for drugs and drug loading. So fer ferritin is also extensively used in vaccine development as well, in drug loading studies in general. And lastly, you have your lipoproteins, which are abundantly found in your body. They're basically fat molecules that form into the shape of nanoparticles. And cholesterol is a great example of a lipoprotein. And because they are abundantly found in your body, they are great to be used as a health diagnostic tool. So uh, our lab does focus on nanotherapeutics for the brain. So I do wanna spend the remainder, the remainder of my talk focusing on the brain in particular. So in Elizabeth's talk, she covered a couple of key advantages that nanoparticles bring to the field of brain uh, treatment of brain injuries. So for example, nanoparticles are small, You know, this allows for easy administration, easy diffusion throughout the tissue. Uh, nanoparticles also have they often have this structure that allows them to protect drugs and loaded cargo from degradation in the body. And as Elizabeth mentioned, there are a lot of customizable parameters as well. So in addition to these advantages of nanomedicine, there are also extra advantages of biologic nanoparticles. Biologic nanoparticles are inherently biocompatible. They're, they also have a lot of inherent cell uptake mechanisms which is a really key uh, feature because you wouldn't have to worry about engineering these into your platform. A lot of them already have uh, interact with cells naturally. And then a lot of biological nanoparticles also are scalable using very standard lab techniques as well. So now something that I focus on a lot in this lab 
And I want to disclaimer, I do work with exosomes, so I will be shamelessly plugging exosome research throughout this talk. But I think a lot about how these nanoparticle platforms traverse through the brain tissue. Um, and that in order to do this, I want to just introduce to you all several techniques of visualizing these biological nanoparticles here, because as you can imagine, to develop therapies, it's really important to be able to visualize nanoparticles as they move through the brain, figure out what cells they interact with in the brain. Um, and so I want to go over several existing methods uh, of how we can do that. So the most standard way of visualizing biological nanoparticles is through fluorescent labeling. So some of you may be familiar with this technique. There are two different types of fluorescent labeling, chemical and genetic. So for chemical, you're using your co either covalently or non-covalently bonding your sample to fluorescent dyes, for example. So here I have an example of exosome with a lipophilic dye that is used to incorporate into the lipid layer. And you can image these exosomes this way. Our lab has actually conjugated exosomes with quantum dots which are another type of nanoparticle. Quantum dots are a semiconducting nanoparticle. And uh, they, by conjugating exosomes to quantum dots, we can actually visualize how they interact with cells. And here's an example uh, from a colleague of mine who's already graduated displaying quantum dots that are in red. Quantum dots bonded to exosomes and that interacting with the cell layer. Uh, which is the microglia, microglia is an immune cell in the brain. So this is a really cool image. Uh, fluorescent labeling, another, another type of it is genetic. So unlike chemical labeling, genetic labeling requires genetic engineering to produce proteins that are expressed on the surface of your sample. So a common protein that is used in genetic uh, fluorescent labeling is GFP or green fluorescent protein. Some of you may have heard of this. It's really used a lot in molecular biology techniques, but this, this type of fluorescent labeling also exists. Another alternative way of visualizing biological nanoparticles is using radio labeling, which basically you're, you're applying radioactive atoms to your sample, either on the surface or within your sample. And radioactive labels are very sensitive, so you can visualize them quite clearly and cleanly, um, and it's used a lot in drug development in pharmaceutical companies to track pharmacokinetics of drugs throughout your body. And lastly, you have electron microscopy, which involves the interaction of electrons with your sample in order to visualize the geometry and topology of your sample. Um, and so our lab has actually used transmission electron microscopy to visualize exosomes. And you can see here using PEM, uh, you can see the beautiful lipid layer of your exosomes. You can see the topology of the exosome surface as well. Electron microscopy is very sensitive. And so that makes it a great visualization, visualization technique. So as you can see, there are lots of methods of visualization. Uh, so it really, at the end of the day, depends on what your experiment is, what resources you have at your disposal. Um, but certainly, this field of exploring biologic nanoparticles is really important to determine how these particles interact with your body. So lastly, I want to close out by talking about therapeutic applications of biological nanoparticles. So I will go over three different aspects. There's ther therapeutic vehicles, there's therapeutic probes, and then there's therapeutic diagnostics. So the first therapeutic vehicles, uh, as I mentioned, biological nanoparticles are inherently biocompatible. There's a lot of great advantages to using them as a therapeutic vehicle. In my work in particular, I evaluate exosomes, so the therapeutic efficacy of exosomes throughout your body. So I actually explore uh, how the treatment of exosomes to injured tissue affects the, uh, affects the cell toxicity and affects the cellular phenotype of immune cells in that tissue. And we found that in an ex vivo injury model, exosomes actually decrease cell toxicity of an injured tissue, and they actually promote this shift in the phenotype of microglia towards an anti-inflammatory phenotype, which is really cool to see. And uh, exome research has also been, a lot of research has been shown, has been kind of focusing on delivering drugs using exosomes. So incorporating drugs within the exosome to like to treat the brain. 
So biological nanoparticles can also be used as probes, for example. Uh, like I showed in the earlier example, you can track, you can track uh, exosomes throughout the different cell interactions in the brain to try to understand how they interact with the tissue. Another group has also used ferritin, which is a blood protein that ferritin actually carries iron throughout your blood. And this group uses ferritin as a way to track iron distribution in neurological diseases, which is really, which is really another great example of using biological nanoparticles as a probe. Lastly, biological nanoparticles are abundant, a lot of them are abundantly in, found in the body, such as lipoproteins. And I mentioned this before briefly, but a uh, lipid panel is a great example of using uh, biological nanoparticles as a way to screen for health, health metrics. Now, I just wanted to pop in with a couple of career things I've learned throughout my years <laughs> of being you know, in the field of nanomedicine and just as a way to talk more about opportunities in nanomedicine. But uh, one thing that I found was really important is that interdisciplinary approaches is really a strength. As Elizabeth said, we, our lab is our main department is chemical engineering, but a lot of us don't have background in chemical engineering. We come from all areas and all walks of life. Um, I, my background is in material science, but even then I have explored many, many a major, many different classes before I chose material science. And I guess my lesson, my, my hope is that people will really explore different fields and don't feel like they need to be boxed in. I also think it's really important to cultivate life experiences. I actually have never had, before joining the NANCE lab, I've never worked with nanotechnology before, but I have been very fortunate to work in, in other areas of uh, therapeutics. So I've worked in a muscular bio lab. Um, I've worked with medical optics and developing a mobile app to treat optical diseases. I've also developed, I've worked in a biomedical startup as well. And I've worked in a vascular engineering lab developing platforms. So even though I've never worked in nanomedicine, um, I've been able to work in many different, work alongside many different researchers that really cultivate my experience. And then lastly, I think it's just important to practice empathetic engineering, understanding, you know, who, who you're helping with your research, why it matters is a, I think critical aspect of being a really great scientist. And so I'm thankful for your, I think science communication is a great aspect, a great way to promote empathetic engineering, being able to communicate our work with the general public. So I really thank all of you for um, this experience today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. That was so interesting. Thank you. Um, um, it's so cool to see where the work has gone. Um, like my have background in material science and did some of this and to see kind of like where it is now, it's just so, so fascinating for me. Um, I'm going to push questions off to the end and make sure that Sydney has time to give her presentation. Um, some people might need to sign off before questions, and, um, but I want to make sure that we get to hear from Sydney before people need to go. So take it away, Sydney. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. Um, let's see. Is it in the right view and everything? Okay. All right, perfect. Uh, so yeah, hi, I'm Sydney. <laughs> um, and I can't wait to talk to you guys about the blood-brain barrier. Um, this has been kind of hinted at uh, all throughout the night. So let's start let's go ahead and, and dive right in and, and talk about it um so bringing it back to uh what elizabeth was speaking about earlier the brain is complicated it's complex it's re responsible for so much of how we exist and move throughout the world um regulating our thoughts and emotions um making sure that our bodies remain a biological homeostasis and also uh, motor skills and vision etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so many processes that the the brain is responsible for, and it's not my my research uh, aspect that's the blood brain barrier, but the the electrochemical communication that happens in the brain is so fascinating to me, and it's definitely one of the um, reasons that the brain uh, was interesting to me um, way back when I first kind of started on this path. But 
to do all this, to do all these processes, to have all these things go on, there's a high demand of energy and nutrients. Um, I'm gonna have kind of like a little running analogy um, with you have all these neurons that are like workers, right? In your brain trying to do all these things. They get tired, they need food. Um, so how are you gonna meet this high energy demand to be able to have all of these things occurring 24 seven every single day? So uh, the vascular system with 400 miles of capillaries can meet this demand. So blood carries the nutrients and the oxygen and those things that we need, all those things to keep the workers happy, to continue doing all the processes that your brain needs every day. But the blood is also a double-edged sword. While it carries the nutrients and the glucose and the energy that our body needs, it also can introduce potential toxins and pathogens. But the brain is a very complex place for all these processes to happen. The microenvironment of the brain needs to be a conducive working environment. If we go back to our workers analogy, uh, OSHA, right? You need a safe working environment. You need your environment to be such that you can uh, do the work that you need to do. So how does the brain maintain this environment to support these complex interactions? In steps the blood brain barrier. Um, so if we dive down deep into the vasculature of the brain, from the brain to the vessel, to the microvasculature, we see this blood-brain barrier. And so basically it's this collection of specialized cells and proteins that surround brain vasculature. Um, so first we have cells that line the inside of the vessel wall, and then we also have cells that support the outside vessel structure. And so... All this together um, makes the blood-brain barrier the key to regulating entrance and exit of molecules, ions, everything that you need for that really complicated um, brain environment. Also protecting from toxins and against neurodegeneration and cell death, which you'll hear a little bit about later. So how does this happen? Uh, let me introduce you to some of the key players in the blood-brain barrier. So first we have endothelial cells. And so endothelial cells line the inside of the vasculature all over the body, but in the brain specifically, the cells line up really, really close to each other and form these tight junctions. And so these junctions are so tight that they are the first line of defense to protecting against um, things entering the brain from the blood. And also because of that, it means that because it's so difficult to cross in between the cells, um, most of the transport happens within the cell. So the endothelial cells kind of decide who they want uh, entering the brain through uh, specialized transporters or other things, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit later as well. We also have pericytes. Um, so the endothelial cells do not act in isolation. It's really this team um, that all support each other. So the pericytes increase the stability of the capillary. They are similar to the smooth muscle cells that line the outside of the vasculature elsewhere in your body. Um, and they also release growth factors that um, allow the endothelial cells to function and have that and maintain those barrier properties. And they also share the basement membrane. Uh, in a similar manner, uh, the astrocytes also release growth factors that uh, contribute to the barrier tightness. And also they are very highly branched to provide a lot of that structural support um, and really anchor the blood-brain barrier with the surrounding cells in the brain, specifically interacting with the neurons and microglia and such. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about science communication. And uh, when I give this talk uh, to uh, I think I typically uh, stop using this metaphor at around second grade, um, but when Encanto, the movie was really, really popular with all the kids, I would call the astrocytes the Louisa cells because they're like the strong sister of the blood-brain barrier. Um, so if that's a helpful metaphor, uh, happy <laughs> to bring that in here as well. Um, but yeah, so together, um, these cells make up the blood-brain barrier and uh, for nutrients and oxygen, which again, we talked about, we need those. For those things, they can pass through. But for things that are typically greater than 400 Daltons, they have to navigate this pretty exclusive terrain of cells. And that includes our therapeutics. <laughs> so why do we even wanna cross the blood-brain barrier anyway? So um, Professor Nance had 
uh, talked about this in her talk as well. Um, but there's a lot of central nervous system disorders that we can't accurately treat because we can't get into this, <laughs> this elective environment. Um, specifically targeted cancer treatments. Um, it's very difficult to treat cancer um, in the brain. Also, if you think about diseases like MS or multiple sclerosis, which really uh, affects the, it, it, it's caused by the difference in myelination of the neurons. That's a, that's a brain cell type. If we could get in and, and fix that, that would, then, you know, it's, it's a brain cell caused disease, but it has widespread body effects. Um, also increasing the options for psychiatric drugs, um, because we have a way to en encapsulate, um, different types of drugs and also being able to take advantage of the, um, the new discoveries in the recombinant protein um, field, those are, these are things that are really big in the medical field that we can't as much take advantage of in the brain because the proteins are just too big. So nanotherapeutics are an emerging option um, to crossing the blood-brain barrier and being able to bring some of these um, medical things uh, in. So we talked a lot about nanoparticles today. Um, and one of the things that Foon had mentioned uh, where that they are extremely tunable. There are a lot of properties you can change about nanoparticles um, to really kind of work with the blood-brain barrier, work with the um, the intrinsic transporters to try to to try to get things across. Uh, one of my uh, one, I, one thing I think is really cool are, are these staged vehicle switching or uh, changing properties of the nanoparticles as they try to go through, um, we have to balance getting across the blood-brain barrier and into the brain space. Um, so with differences in pHs uh, between like the cell membrane and the inside of the cell, you can kind of uh, use that. Um, and so things like surface charge, um, you can see from some members of our lab, that uh, when you have a neutral surface charge, you have that, uh, so you have the more colors, so it's m diffusing more, getting past the blood-brain barrier, getting into the, the blood, the uh, brain space. And also if you take advantage of surface functionalization, um, so again, kind of balancing that, um, getting into the blood-brain barrier, well, across the blood-brain barrier, and then also into the um, extracellular space. So disease states also impact the blood-brain barrier and introduce additional considerations uh, in addition to trying to get the blood, trying to get nanoparticles across an intact and healthy blood-brain barrier. So um, this is what, this is a kind of schematic of what happens to the blood-brain barrier, uh, the BBB microenvironment in a, a tumor scenario, right? So even, so you see that it's the blood-brain barrier is more, uh, there's, it's more leaky, it's more permeable, but it also um, allows for um, other things to cross and it complicates the, out, the, the perivascular space, um, that space right outside of the blood-brain barrier. Um, similarly, with traumatic injury, now we have all these uh, cellular things going on, and we also have neuronal death, neuronal death um, which is never, ever good. And then finally, with stroke, um, you really see um, the leakiness and the permeability and things leaking out of that blood-brain barrier and out of that vessel, um, and then you see all the changes in the extracellular space. So this is kind of the, what I want, if you gain, if you Take away nothing from this talk. Um, an intact blood-brain barrier is not the enemy, right? So, so I, it, you might think, oh, well, if we're trying to get things across a blood-brain barrier, let's just obliterate it. And that's not the answer. Um, pathological blood-brain barrier breakdown often causes further damage. So we really need to figure out how to partner with the blood-brain barrier and all of its uh, stages to be able to uh, effectively treat brain diseases. Um, and also I just kind of wanted to, you know, not to worry, we, we, we have seen uh, in our lab, we do a lot of uh, modeling uh, stroke conditions and trying to see uh, how nanoparticle passage in that condition uh, works. And so this is an example of that. So we just saw the stroke environment. Uh, this was an induced stroke environment in a model. And you see that uh, the surface characteristics of the nanoparticles uh, do affect the crossing of the blood-brain barrier and the distribution uh, in the tissue space. So there is hope. Uh, tunable surface functionalization does allow for uh, this blood-brain barrier transport. Uh, so yeah, so there is a lot of promising potential for nanomedicine in the brain. 
Um, <laughs> you gotta think of nanoparticles as these superheroes uh, coming to help us really tackle these extremely difficult uh, problems to, you know, these medical problems with the brain um, because of their tunable characteristics in a dynamic and changing brain microenvironment. Because they allow for controlled delivery for sustained release in healthy and disease states, uh, nanoparticles uh, open the long elusive doors uh, for treatment of neurological diseases. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome, Sydney. Thank you. Thank you. I remember reading some papers early on that talked about, you know, let's just open up the blood brain barrier and just let everything in. I remember at the time thinking like that, that doesn't sound like a great idea. I wouldn't want someone doing that to me. And now, now we see why. Um, so thank you for this work. It's just so fascinating. Um, if anyone in our, in our watch group has questions, let me know. Uh, I have some questions prepared, but if you have specific questions, just drop them any way that you can. Um, um I have a question. Yeah. Um, for any of you, all of you, um, do, does your lab, um, synthesize your own nanoparticles or are there companies that sort of like regularly make all of these different types um, and to uh, custom specifications? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. Um, we actually try to purchase commercially available uh, particles, partly because we want to work with things that are already kind of in the commercial pipeline for our applications in children. Um, we're trying to do stuff that's either been tested in adults or has been tested enough that there is a commercial product available because there's a market for it, which enables us to have potential greater chances of translation into kids specifically. Um, but there's a lot of ways that that can be tuned. And there's a lot of groups who, because they like the level of control over each individual component, will do synthesis in their, in their own labs. And so we'll collaborate with some of those groups if we really want to like specifically get into a you know sort of level of control that we would be too expensive to do like to purchase commercially or ask for commercially um but we but our group is kind of weird in the nano field because we don't synthesize stuff ourselves and we intentionally go with uh commercially available products and i say that because commercially available means established to most people and established equates boring when you're thinking about like technology innovation but we want boring to go into babies. <laughs> we, we don't want that to be exciting. <laughs> I mean, exciting as in the, we don't know what's going to happen uh, since. We want to know what's going to happen. <laughs> we want to be pretty confident about it. Spoon produces her own though. She gets, uh, she gets all of hers, uh, her biological particles. She has a very extensively refined uh, process for separating these biological mm -hmm. nanoparticles from the brain itself. So like isolate, isolating them directly from brain tissue. Um, Dr. Nance, I was interested to hear a little bit about how you have decided to focus on pediatric and especially like infants. Uh, that seems to be unusual. And you, you mentioned that that is an underserved population. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, my honest response is it really pisses me off when people say that they're not going to do things because it's hard or because there's not a market in a population. Uh, and so that's a place where I then want to spend time because I it annoys me when people are like, we shouldn't serve this population because of whatever ridiculous reasons. So that's my honest response. My, my practical response is that because there's so little done there, um, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot of impact we can have, even if it's incremental. And I think that's really important to think about with kind of the rapidly evolving scientific world we live in these days, where there's new stuff coming out left and right every day. The risk of people, you know, quote unquote, scooping somebody is high in certain fields. And so for us to be working solely in that application space in newborns and kids, where a lot of people don't want to spend time, it gives us a lot of places to have impact in ways that we can advance the field, even if incrementally, uh, in a way that always moves it forward. And I think that's that's exciting. Um, I also think it, it's a great way to kind of show that we can engineer technologies for a wide range of applications, including those that can be scary um, or intimidating or complex or that we don't have a lot of information for. So one thing that makes me the most proud to work with like the students that I get to work with is that they go into these spaces where we know very little 
we do not have a lot of guidance in the work that we're doing. Um, and they're risk takers, they're courageous, they're brave students for getting into this research because a lot of times the questions we're asking, there is no known answer to. <laughs> like, you know, we, we don't even know necessarily what the boundary conditions are. Like, what are our constraints? Uh, a lot of times we don't know that. And so I think that's a really great, it's a hard training space, but I think it's a really great training space. And we've seen a lot of members in our lab really be able to embrace that and bring their full like kind of innovation and creativity to that space because there's not like our constraints is just what we don't know um and i think that's a really cool kind of place to operate in but practically there's impact we can have um regardless of kind of how small or big that impact is scientifically it's still impact in sort of the real world um setting that's a great answer. I know that feeling as a journalist too, just people saying, oh, well, that those people don't matter because, um, and that's part of the reason I think why a lot of us do the work we do is because that also pisses us off. Um, so I really, yeah. I, I really love to hear that first. Sorry, part. I remember this is recorded. I was like, well, I'll just give the honest answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, I mean, I, I, you could say I get pissed off when people don't help babies. I, I don't think anyone can come for you for that. Um, I have, yes. I think some questions popping up on the chat. Um, the first one is, are there differences in how transport occurs in pediatric brains versus adult? Um, That's a great question. Um, I think Cindy's done quite a bit of work uh, in some of her prior research on thinking about like Alzheimer's um, brains and kind of what that environment looks like. So I'll let her comment on that. But I know that, you know, so much of our basic physiology in the brain is conserved um across both species but also across age and so one of the things that we try and understand is what changes as the brain develops actually matter and affect us the like how a drug would interact or affect how a drug would be um delivered but then i think like i'll i'll get Sydney to kind of comment on because she's done a lot of work in looking into sort of like the alzheimer's brain and that obviously introduces a whole different set of potential um, challenges. So if we think about the aging end of the spectrum and kind of that range of what, you know, the brain looks like, I think Cindy can probably comment on how that transport or, you know, things that in, are in that space can um, change. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to preface this response with that I am a second year PhD student. Um, but something that I, Elizabeth was taught or Professor Ness was talking about um, that my work is it's modeling the blood-brain barrier and um, part of that I actually take primary cells um, and try to have them grow outside of the body and see uh, if they retain those properties that I kind of talked about that contribute to uh, the blood-brain barrier and so it's really I'm I'm looking forward to investigating this more um, through my PhD because right now um, we have like so what I've seen is so the astrocytes actually take them from a younger age um, and they are much more proliferative, much more much stronger um, in the younger age, whereas the more the vascular cells, the endothelial cells and parasites aren't as um, developed yet. And so I typically have to wait for an older age to kind of get those mature um, that mature vasculature structure to happen. Um, so I don't know where that um, where that bar is really for for humans like does that happen before birth after birth like what but I I would I would think that there is a line with kind of like but but also it's like the different cells right because maybe because since the astrocytes are more uh responsive and stronger at the younger age perhaps they're taking on the brunt of that maintaining those ba that barrier tightness as opposed to the endothelial cells maybe it it shifts um so I would I would venture to guess that there are changes but kind of maybe overall that she like she mentioned matters to drug delivery maybe not so much um but definitely things kind of at the um at the the cellular scale and she was also talking about kind of the alzheimer's space alzheimer's is really interesting along with a lot of these neurodegenerative diseases because while they are age related uh it's not just age right and so it's really those those changes in the blood brain barrier that leakiness the uh the, the things that are going wrong with the cells um so it's really interesting kind of to see the difference um and yeah so <laughs> long-winded answer uh <laughs> but yeah yeah i just want to plug in by saying that i think a popular opinion used to be that babies did not have a developed blood brain barrier but that has since 
like recently been uh, discredited. And I think now uh, the idea now, like moving forward with nanotechnology is that even neonates have a fully functional blood brain barrier and we have to take that into account when developing therapeutics. They but yeah, I think- know, They didn't even know whether or not babies had a blood brain barrier. That's kind of amazing to me. It is, it is an interesting thing. So it, in a, it's actually a great, it's a 1929 paper showed that the blood brain barrier when a baby is born was functionally intact, but because it was published in this kind of obscure journal, a lot of people didn't appreciate or kind of see the work. And then all the studies that followed up, like Spoon was mentioning, did studies in such a way that it showed that the brain of the of a newborn was actually not like a barrier. It wasn't acting as barrier property. And they, when more recent studies were done, they showed that what they were doing in those experiments was basically causing toxicity that would break down the blood-brain barrier that would then show that it was permeable because they weren't adjusting for the weight or the age of the of the animals or the humans when they were doing these studies. And so they were basically doing an adult dose in a, in a newborn, um, which was toxic to the newborn brain capillaries, which then show that they were permeable. And so it was a great example of where we see all the time that when things are done in adults, if you just linearly scale it down to kids, it doesn't work because physiology isn't linear. Um, and so it was just fascinating, you know, but, but very, it caused this massive, like hundred year, you know, um, misunderstanding of the fact that the blood brain barrier was, was not functional when you were born, but you wouldn't be born without a functionally protected brain. So like it contrad you know, it goes against what common sense would tell you, but these studies were just not well designed, honestly, um, and were done in such a way they were more thinking of adult physiology rather than newborn physiology. Um, and so we're just, you know, not well controlled. Um, and it's a, that's a, a challenge like soon brings up, is this a big challenge in the field is so much is extrapolated from adults. That's another reason why it's hard to do stuff in, in children because you can't just do this linear extrapolation from what happens in an adult to what happens in a child because so much of physiology, your metabolism, your respiratory rate, your urination rate, your how fast things sit in your you know, gastrointestinal tract, all of the receptors that are expressed on endothelium, endothelial cells, all these things change with age and with time and with environmental factors. And so you can't assume that what happens in an adult is just a, like happens on a smaller scale um, in, a, in a newborn. But that that blood brain barrier aspect was a really great example in a bad way <laughs> of, right. of where that where those comparisons really fail. Right. Well, I, I don't want to keep you guys for too long. Does anyone have any uh, final questions that you would like to ask the speakers? I think Ellen had one more question about. I, I just. Yeah, I just wanted to say, like, I, I'm so thrilled that you support your trainees in, you know, sharing their science and, and then they get experience, you know, speaking a lot also, but just kudos to all three of you for being able to communicate so well to the general public. I think it's something that's really missing and needed so much more and aligns with university, you know, mission of disseminating that knowledge. Um, but I know, at least when I was in grad school, you know, it took away from lab time and so it was not supported. And I'm wondering um, for you, Elizabeth, if it's something that has changed where, I mean, you're kind of a badass, so you can do what you want, but for <laughs> normal, or typical just scientists, the rules and ask for forgiveness later. Like that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. But is it, I mean, do you feel like it's more supported now? I know people are listing it on their, you know, in the promotional packages for 10 year promotion or on, yeah. you know, they're listing it on their CVs. Is it changing to be more valued, I guess? Yeah, I think so. I think actually, uh, again, like the COVID-19 pandemic really gave us a great example of where science has this critical role to be more real time communicating their science, because we saw the misinformation that came out around particularly the vaccines. Um, you know, the fact that there was thinking that there was computer chips that were being, you were being controlled by like any, like that's not realistic to put into one of these nanoparticles, right? You need a battery, you need an energy source, like, but I mean, you can't blame the public when there's not any sort of shared understanding about what these things are. And then if we think about where information has come from, like pop culture, why wouldn't the people think that these things are going to be like collective swarm control and, you know, you, then you're going to get dictated by the government on what, you know, because they can control these nanoparticles injected into your body. I mean, every single science fiction novel says that's exactly what happens. So if we don't have real-time communication of what 
you know, these technologies are, then we see very quickly, the pandemic gave us a great example of where that goes awry and what problems can come out of it. And I think the pandemic also gave us an example of where like we were seeing science play out in real time, right? You, most people don't usually pay attention to when clinical trials, like what's going on in clinical trials, you know, and when they fail and the fact that not that they fail, but they get stopped for very normal parts of their process if there's problems in them. But the second that happened when this was playing out real time, we saw the sort of public outcry or the public concern. And that was a great example of where we as scientists have really failed to keep the public in step with us as our science is developing and as we're kind of putting our science out there. Uh, I think it's actually, I'm mostly inspired by the next generation of students. I mean, Foon and Sydney and, and Holly and several other students in the group come in with this commitment and I think awareness of where this is like a priority to, to get the science out there and to disseminate the science because otherwise it stays excluded and siloed and isolated in a way that takes away from its lot, a lot of its impact and meaning. And I think this comes from thinking about more of kind of a global connected community that we have and access to information sharing that we have now that honestly was, I mean, I was born in, in 85, so I'm, I'm a millennial, I'm like a hardcore millennial, but that's still like, you know, we had a home computer that was a little, I remember the Apple IIe computers where I chased a little green worm across the screen, like in schools. I, some of you know that. that. I don't think City and Sue will have any idea what I'm talking about, but like the generational <laughs> transition has been very rapid in a relatively short time. And what inspires me is that students like Cindy and Foon and, and a lot of others are, in, are not seeing that as a barrier. They're seeing that as an enabler. They're seeing that as something they can take advantage of as something that can be like that, that can help advance the science. It's not something working against the science. And I think that's really exciting and really cool and also allows for partnerships with science, like, you know, professional science communication people um, to really engage in a way that we haven't been able to engage with um, previously. Absolutely. And it speaks to equity too, that through social media, you are reaching so many more people in such a more accessible way. It's tremendously important. And please consider us as a resource if if you have questions or, or anything to do with inclusive language or how to do something we're here for you so I also love seeing some familiar names on the people who who attend attended this talk I'm there's some proud family members so thank you also for joining tonight you must be tremendously proud of your your relatives um and with that I think we'll sign off I'll we'll just be in touch by email about the the gift cards for 